Hi. We've just had an election in the U.S. and the winner is projected to prevail by a margin of, I believe, 52% to 47%, with the 1% being a third party. I voted for, for the third party. But what's significant about this election is not the winner. What's significant is how divided the United States has become. In, in fact, that 1% is crucial because based on the specific political system in the US, had the third party voters, the libertarians, voted exclusively for the opposition candidate, or in this case, the projected loser, the projected loser would actually be the winner based on the state by state voting system that we have here in the US. So regardless of what happens over the, over the next 48 years, the real result of this election is a demonstration of how divided the United States has become. And that's important. It's important to realize, well, first of all, to try to figure out the causes. And let's talk about that. I, I think one of, the, one of the ideas is that the United States is now bound together by debt and religion as a wish granting system rather than a way of life. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, right now, the United States has about $26 trillion in debt. Almost all of it is presumed is, is probably in its own currency. So what that means is that it can print as much money as it wants. And if, if it wanted to, it could wipe out all of its debt at the risk of inflation. And the problem with all that is that we already have inflation. We have uneven inflation. We have a country that's divided not only by political beliefs, but by projected inflation and historical inflation in assets. So I'm here in a neighborhood where a house like this is, I just, is worth probably a million dollars, which would put that house presumably in the top 5%, probably even higher in the entire country. Now you see that house is nothing special. If I go over to Omaha, Nebraska, the home of, a, of an American billionaire, a house like that would be $150,000, maybe even, maybe even cheaper, depending on, on where you are. And part of that is historical segregation. If you buy a house on the wrong side of the tracks in a place where, because of racial animus due to slavery, you know, the economy just isn't very good and therefore safety is questionable. The same house five miles away, depending on where it is and depending on what school district it is, could be half off. So we've got firm political opinions in an environment of uneven inflation, which doesn't bode well because it cements fundamentalism. With respect to Christianity as a wish-granting system based on prayer, you have to compare it to other religions, other Abrahamic religions, and we can do that by studying Islam. With Islam, you have to remember that it's a difficult religion. The fasting is strenuous. It's not easy. The, uh, there are specific tasks that you have to do. There are five pillars. You have to pray five times a day and so on and so forth. Now, the reason for that is because historically you had a choice. You could not be a slave and be Muslim at the same time. That's not, that was not a possibility. You could be Christian and be a slave. You could not be Muslim and be a slave. That was not, that was a logical impossibility. So in order to make it difficult, well, you can see why it was made difficult. And you can also see why it was a way of life as opposed to a system that's based on beliefs. It was something that you had to do, not something that you had to believe. And this is one of the reasons why Islam flourished. Its competition at the time was either too small, 
like Judaism, or openly embracing differences and an exploitation of differences in order to suppress wages. Now, Islam was founded by an orphan and who was married to an older woman who was a successful businesswoman. And so within this context, you have a system that respects the minority. Now, I don't claim that this is the same system we have today. The concentration of power uh, is the same whether you're in a Christian country in 2020 or in a Muslim country in 2020. It may very well be that the United States has unequal inflation, which has resulted in a path towards a fundamental oligarchy, or fundamentalist oligarchy. But that's the same if you go to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is the birthplace of the Islamic prophet. So we have to be careful when we're discussing religion to separate it from, to separate the origins from the modern day political context. But the fact remains that the system was specific in order to weed out people who were insincere. And this is not the case with Christianity. Now, when we're talking about Christianity, you have to separate these things as well. Because Catholicism, the way to look at Christianity is that you have Catholicism, which rose to power based on aligning itself with royalty. And then you have everyone else. You have all the offshoots of that exclusive network that is based not only on a hierarchy, but on an oligarchy that seeks to amass power and distribute it exclusively to people within that kingdom. If you look at Catholicism from that context, a lot of modern day inequality makes sense. But again, that's true today, whether you're in a Muslim country, a Christian country, or probably a Jewish majority city or state or country. So that has to do with the fact that the binding agent is debt in most countries, not just Christian countries. And what makes the United States less susceptible to a, to a Soviet Union style breakup is that it can issue as much debt as it wants today and therefore maintain the system of allegiances between states. So let's say Texas finds it profitable to separate and become independent again. The federal government need only to issue more debt, essentially buy people off. Now, this program is obviously, this system is obviously insincere. It's not based on deeds. It's based on wishes. It's based on granting wishes and bribery in order to maintain cohesion. So the overall problem here has been not only uneven prosperity, but just the fact that most countries lack a binding agent that is based on deeds within a system that can provide cohesion regardless of race, ethnicity, national origin, and so on and so forth. There's this other sort of offshoot that we haven't discussed, which is that political systems are conduits for economic systems. So communism was a conduit for a non-debt-based system that heavily em emphasized scientific progress and utility. That unfortunately led to the exploitation of smaller vassal states, which were used for everything from farming, forced farming, collect you know, collectives, to you know, nuclear testing, and so on and so forth. But once we realize that political systems are conduits for economic systems, you can look at capitalism as a kind of system that when combined with Catholicism leads to an oligarchy. And you can study almost any country where the Catholic Church has substantial influence and you'll see that it's 
essentially an oligarchy, which makes sense once we consider the history of Christianity and Catholicism, which, as we just said, was based on a system of aligning yourself with the king and then essentially ruling over a kingdom for the exclusive benefit of that kingdom's residents. Now, what does this have to do with today? With this divided system that will probably sustain itself in the near future based on debt or bribery or whatnot. And we don't really know. The system still works on some level, but obviously not very well for the majority of people. So that's one of the reasons that China is succeeding. China has a system that has rivaled capitalism in the sense that it's shown that a one-party system might actually work if you don't have diversity. If you don't have a system where you have to create wage suppression based on slavery or force or coercion, and furthermore, it's linked into a global system. And that's important because we've, at least my generation has grown up looking at the fall of the Soviet Union, looking at the fall of East Germany, the GDR, or the Deutschland Democratic Republic, the DDR. And we've been convinced that capitalism, Western style capitalism, is the antidote to the world's problems. But it's like life, it's a long game, not a short game. And what we see now is that Russia actually has a surplus, or had a surplus as of 2019. And the United States had a trillion dollar deficit indicating similar problems that precipitated the breakup of the Soviet Union. Namely, an inability to bribe all these vassal states, far away vassal states, in ways that created cohesion. And the United States, as I've said before, is similar to the Soviet Union, but with better propaganda. But the, the Soviets, of course, used plenty of propaganda. They emphasized equality between the, the genders. Um, that was probably based on a farming, you know, the sickle and the hammer. They emphasized large scale infrastructure projects that are still there, by the way. The trains they built are still in Eastern Europe. The escalators they built are still there. The elevators are still there and so on and so forth. The United States has an issue because its propaganda is based on this idea of intangible progress. And it's a little bit easier for the United States to pursue that path because its history is so blighted with discrimination, with racism, with segregation and so on. So within that context, if you see, say, the relationship between a black woman and a, and a white man, within that context in the U.S., it is a remarkable achievement. But not when you think about <laughs> other countries that managed to avoid chattel slavery, that managed to avoid race-based discrimination. Non-Christian countries, for example. But this is not a religious issue. We know that, you know, if you go to India, uh, or it's not an ethnic issue because we know, or a racial issue exclusively. Go to India, the claim is that Muslims who number 100 million within that country of a billion are treated like second class citizens. And if you go to another American ally, Israel, the claim is also that the Palestinians, who are similar, of similar ethnicity, are also treated like second-class citizens. So the dividing line, quite frankly, seems to be based on a post-World War II network or timeline where that, that stopped after the removal of Western governance and Western military law backed up by Western military presence. The idea was that you would divide people based on you know, their religion and that's how you have India and Pakistan. That's how you have 
you know, Malaysia and, and, and Singapore, which Singapore being the Chinese majority, and Malaysia being obviously the, the Malaysian, the Malay majority. Not perfectly though, right? You have Sarawak, you have a lot of little independent places, Putrajaya, that are quasi-independent. Uh, Sarawak, because it's got oil, and so it can afford probably to have its own military, its own police force, it's independent from the central government. So when you look at everything in, in context, you see a couple of trends. One of which is that the capitalistic post-World War II order succeeded in large part because of debt. And that debt is now going to be that same system's undoing. And the competitors to that post-World War II framework that, that avoided debt and that focused on infrastructure are actually more successful in terms of creating or a sustainable middle class. We know that because in the U.S., based on this capitalistic system that uses debt to bind people together, because it can't do so anymore based on idealism, based on religion, based on anything else, really, that's intangible. We know that because here there's about one to two trillion dollars of student loans, which is a form of making people pay to work, which goes back to why communism was so successful in the past, because you had not just chattel slavery, you had, you had opposition to a slave-based system that suppressed wages unfairly. But of course you had what was called the rentier class. I'm, I'm mispronouncing it, it's a French word, rentier, that sought to use the law to oppress essentially poor people, hardworking poor people. The hammer, the builder, and the sickle, farmer. And so, Within that opposition, it turns out the opposition has pursued sustainable growth, but within a capitalistic system of globalization. Now, everyone copies each other. The Christians copied the Muslims when it came to math and science. Catholicism was, at the time, anti-science and so on, because it, it was based, again, on storytelling, on wish-making and wish-granting. Not science, not math, not logic essentially propaganda. And so when it interacted with the Muslims, it managed to essentially steal the Muslims' advances. And, and the Muslims, by the way, benefited from Jewish residents. A lot of scholars within Islamic communities, whether in Cordoba or now modern day Iraq, were Jewish. So along comes Catholicism. It, it, has to, essentially loses the Roman Empire in Italy, has to move to Germany, and quite frankly, it looks like at this point, it's <laughs> sort of lost Germany and has now moved to Washington, D.C. in order to create another global empire. But there's no question that right around 1511, when Portugal, which was sort of aligned with Catholic Spain, sort of, uh, there's no question that when it took control of what is now known as the, as the South China Sea, those shipping routes, there's no question that it, that, that precipitated the rise of Western civilization. In other words, stealing the Muslim Asian shipping routes through force, issuing debt, and engaging in wage suppression through slavery. And that empire lasted from 1511 until 2001. 2001 is obviously known for the horrific attack against New York, but it was also the year that China joined the International Economic Order, the WTO. So it seems quite clear that within the same context that we're looking at the rise of a competitor to the United States in the form of China. And that is something that is still being processed as we speak. But we know China is succeeding because the United States is trying everything it can to suppress China's economic growth. It's aligning itself with India, which is quite easy because it was easier because the Indians were colonized by the British and therefore speak the same language. Uh, at the same time, that's happening 
the Russians and the Chinese have aligned themselves with Pakistan. Remember, there was that two-state solution. You divide people based on ethnicity or race or religion under a two-state solution. And then you use debt in order to prop up and advance the people on your side of the equation. And what that does, or what that's done in the past, is that it's created an incentive for opposition countries to fund the other side of that two-state solution in order to create a buffer. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, that you know you could see why the world order was at that point. Uh, at that point, you could see why so many people, including myself, were convinced that a Western-style capitalist system system was the answer. And indeed, at the time, it was. At that time, the United States was offering one of the highest standards of living worldwide. And it wasn't that Russia or the Soviet Union was not offering a reasonable path to a decent life. It was they just didn't have the propaganda, right? They didn't have the debt to have the marketing and so on and so forth. So they couldn't really advertise their way of life and therefore attract the best citizens from all over the world. And that's changing now, right? Because now, remember, Russia has a surplus and it can go back and align itself with China and then create a system that is in opposition to the rise of the Christian West, which is based on taking over the South China Sea around 1511, stealing technology and science from the Muslims around that same period. And now what's happened post 2001 is that the, the competition, the new wave, the new order, has, has gotten there by stealing technology and science from the United States. So you see, everything now is essentially based on stealing and theft, but that's the way it's always been done. So when the United States complains about China stealing technology, about unfair legal arrangements, you need only point to Hong Kong or Guantanamo Bay or all these other little outposts that the West created in order to maintain the shipping empire all over the world that would give itself an advantage over countries like China and the Soviet Union, which were more land-based and infrastructure-based systems. Now, it turns out that if you're able to build infrastructure in a way that reduces your need, on, need to have oil, which is something that is rapidly becoming a possibility. It turns out that a land-based system might actually work. So the Chinese system and the Soviet Union system was, might have been correct, but it was too early. It was before the ability to wean yourself off oil and natural gas. And today, it is the Chinese, not the Americans, that are the leaders in green energy. It is the Chinese, not the Americans, that are able to build easily cities of 10 million people you can consider those cities essentially mid-sized cities whereas the united states if you're in a city like i am today today right now of a city of 1 million people that is considered to be in the top 20. so the other problem that we've arrived at is what happens when you have uneven inflation which causes prices to go up and then at the same time that you cannot do wage suppression by force, you end up with having more segregation, but based on politics, based on your political party, and what money that political party will give to what people and what organizations within that community, as opposed to merit, as opposed to something else other than making sure the debt that has been amassed is paid off gradually. In, in, order to roll over, in order to roll over that debt and maintain the current system. But you see the problem. The most advanced, one of them, the other advanced country is Japan. Once again, a population problem. We built from scratch, brand new, basically futuristic compared to Tokyo, at least compared to any other city in the whole world. And again, problems with population growth. 
which China obviously does not have. And that's what happens when you're able to create a system that's not based on debt being funneled to specific people based on a system of favors. And if you're a Catholic, you know what I'm really talking about here, indulgences. And you have that system that tends to promote certain groups and not others within a system that was, that catapulted to the top based on this intangible idea of diversity and equality. When in fact, the political infrastructure is the same. That politician has been in office for at least 10 years. They keep moving him around. Uh, went to the same high school, a Catholic private high school that now costs thirty to forty thousand dollars a year, as the current mayor of this city, one of the, one of the largest cities in the, in the in the U.S. And so you start to see that this system of theft, of debt, of wage suppression, what is going to replace it? Because it can't be replaced by a system that is Chinese simply because the Chinese are able to have a one-party system due to the fact that they're not really diverse. Or I should say, as diverse as other countries. And therefore have fewer problems uh, socially. And of course, we are still in a position where not only, as I've said before, we're creating a new Berlin Wall based on technology. You know, I have WeChat on my phone, but I don't have all the features. It's not something, because I don't speak, I don't speak uh, Mandarin. I don't speak any of the dialects like Cantonese. So I can't really use the system. And quite frankly, China doesn't care, right? It's got plenty of people that it has to feed and create jobs for within its own country. And it's been adept at using the globalized economic system in order to get there. That is interestingly enough, based on a land-based economic supply chain that failed before in the 20th century that now looks like it's going to succeed in the 21st century because of technology, much of which it has stolen from the West. When I say steal, I know I'm using a harsh word. We can say borrowed, improved upon, and so on and so forth. But as I said before, everyone copies everyone else. And that seems to be the lesson here when you're creating, one of the lessons is that when you're creating a new world order, morality is something that comes after the fact. But the problem of wage suppression within a context of uneven inflation is something that's going to affect China too. Not today, perhaps not in the next 10, 15 years, but certainly over time. Because all of it is based on debt. Whether you're in China whether you're in an atheist system, a communist system, a capitalist system, a Christian system, or an Islamic system. And what's odd about the Islamic situation is that, remember that the Prophet Muhammad was able to catapult to power in part because he united all the tribes that were either pagan or that had an, had an economy based on slaves, slave trading. He was able to unite the entire peninsula and beyond simply because he paid attention to the people that were ignored by the elites. And so, he was able to build a vast empire and a vast army. Once again, using a land-based system of conquest. And today, that system of unification has been torn asunder. The Islamic community is now divided. You have these little offshoots you know, Yemen, you've got Jordan, that are being propped up by Western Christian money. So what is interesting is the way that's happened. And that goes back to what I talked about with respect to the, the West creating its, its position on, on a pedestal based on, a, on an alleged defense of minority rights. And what has really happened is that the United States, as well as other countries, have chosen to, again, steal natural resources of other countries, whether legally, i.e. indirectly or directly, 
and it's not just the West. The Russians did the same thing recently in Crimea. And, you know, a while ago, Armenia did the same thing to Azer Azerbaijan. And recently, Azerbaijan took back the land that it lost. It just goes back and forth over and over again based on which system you happen to be a part of and which system is willing to essentially risk a third world war. So obviously it's an unsustainable system, but with respect to this idea, you can see that the Islamic system has been broken apart and therefore is not necessarily in a position to lead. And that is, again, based on the shift from a land-based system of trade into a sea-based system of trade, which moved away from the strengths of the Muslims who were, you know, obviously, you know, founded in, in a desert type area, although obviously there's more than just desert, but for the most part, if you're connected to the continent of Asia, we don't necessarily logically see a need to become an expert on ships because there's just so much territory out there and so many enemies as well, whether it's, you know, the uh, Genghis Khan or, or somebody else, right, who's coming on horseback or who has invented another sort of weapon that is land-based. Whereas if you're in an isolated place, like the United States, that's isolated from, you know, Africa and Asia, you can see why shipbuilding would be high on the list in order to facilitate trade and debt and so on and so forth. But the problem with this intangible propaganda, this propaganda based on intangible factors and storytelling, is that what it really does appear that the Western system has paid, used religion in other countries in order to bolster a minority political class of some sort, and then use that minority's grievances in order to justify invasion. And so if you ask somebody today in the US what religion was Saddam Hussein, most people would say that he's, he was Muslim. If you ask people what religion was Hitler, most people would say that he was atheist. In fact, Hitler was raised Catholic, his mother was Catholic, and Saddam Hussein was not really a Muslim. Uh, he was a member of the party Ba'ath, which was not a Muslim party. In other words, it wasn't, say, like the Muslim Brotherhood or the Christian Democrats in Germany and so on and so forth. And so what you see here is that defense of the minority has been used as an excuse to continue this World War II framework of the theft of resources that has been happening for centuries. And that is one of the reasons why the West, if it wants to move forward, is going to have serious problems in terms of maintaining this image of diversity, of sincerity, of an economic system that is worth copying. If in fact, it's all been based on storytelling and the bolstering and funding of a small minority overseas in order to use their protection as a way to insert the United States' at this point greatest strength, which is its military. And if you look at that, then you also see why domestically the United States is having problems because you start to realize, well, we've got a little Vietnam here about 20 miles away. A lot of those people are here because the United States lost the war in Vietnam. So suddenly, because the United States lost the war, it has to bring back the people that it funded in order to save them from being massacred in a revolution or another war or a civil war. And so suddenly the, the diversity in the US looks less than benign. It looks like something that is coercive, that is by force, that is by necessity. So I was born out of the United States. My father was studying in Scotland and could not go back to the United States. Sorry, could not go back to his home country, Iran, because of a response to unfair terms that the British 
now what is now British Petroleum, what was known as the Anglo, I believe it was the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, negotiated in ways that, again, bolstered an elite capitalistic class at the expense of rank-and-file workers and that placed the interests of this globalized economy, this globalized economic system, above wage and hourly workers. And this system has lasted quite some time because, remember, uneven inflation actually makes it easier for the political class to maintain propaganda. If you can have a, you know, 1% of your society in a big country is still, you know, millions of people, um, or at least, you know, hundreds of thousands. And so that's plenty of, you know, fodder for propaganda, especially, again, if you have to have a system of education that is not doing a good job in terms of elevating or creating a middle class in a sustainable way. And so you put all these things together, what you realize is that the inequality is a feature, not a bug, because it's based on a globalized system. In other words, treating the globalized system, which, which is based on shipping within Christian empires, within the West, it's based on treating those empires, putting their interests above the interests of a diverse citizen, citizenry or residency back home domestically. And the reason for that is debt. Remember, in order to build all those systems of trade, you, you not only have to go in debt, you have to put your partners in debt. So they have an interest in maintaining you know, ties to your banking system and therefore your security. JP Morgan, one of the largest banks in the US, spends about $10 billion a year on security. You can see right away why it would be in the interest of a partner of the United States to partner with that kind of a system and to use that kind of a system. And furthermore, if it costs that much money to build a system or to protect a system, you know, what is the cost of creating an alternative? And therefore, how do developing countries manage their own destiny in a way that's separate from this Western-based economic system? And that is the answer that China is coming up with now, as well as the Soviet, as well as Russia, as well as Iran, which have been thus far, in some ways, forced to operate outside of the prevailing economic system because of sanctions or other reasons. And so the issue going forward is quite frankly, whether China is going to be able to build a system, especially a technological system, a banking system that is secure enough and universal enough to be used by everyone that wants to move away from the American or the Western system. And if not, then the next question is whether or not the EU is going to be able, able to build a system by aligning itself with its natural allies on a land-based system. It's connected, of course, to Asia. If that happens, the future of the world will be, in other words, if you're optimistic about Western civilization, the future of the world will be a EU, China, Russian system as, that then seeks to partner with, with as many people in Africa as possible in order to project not just culture, but their own economic systems, their own security, their own banking systems, their own technology into that continent in order to earn the right to have a stay in the future as well as physical security. And this is obviously something that, that the EU is, is uniquely or, or particularly interested in because it, it's not just migrants, not, it's not just a possibility of illegal immigration, but it's just the fact that, you know, it's security, right? You know, in an age where weapons have, and technology have quite frankly, far outpaced humanity's ability to incorporate them within our daily lives in a, in a sustainable way, you know, it just makes sense for the EU to do as much as it can to make as many friends as it can, especially in an environment where the United States is diminishing 
in stature and in every other possible way. Because again, nobody wants to copy its educational system, nobody wants to copy its political system. Increasingly, nobody wants to copy its Catholic-based religion. And one of the advantages the EU has is that it kicked out the Catholics. In other words, remember, except for some small places, like in Rome, obviously, and in Saxony, uh, in Germany, the place of the new Holy Roman Empire, which was so oppressive it gave rise to Martin Luther, and before then, Jan Hus in Czech, uh, and so on and so forth. So the EU does, does have quite a few advantages because it's learned from the past. It's learned that these royalty-based exclusive economic systems don't work. And now the question is whether or not Germany is going to be able to lead the way in terms of culture. And the EU is in a unique position because the Germans have, have of course, at the same time that the Americans have moved away from refugees, the Germans have, of course, created, uh, accepted a lot of refugees and are increasingly appearing to be similar to the culture of the, of the United States that I grew up in, that I grew up loving. It was an open culture that was accepting of sincere diversity, sincere integration. And then, of course, within the EU, you have this opposition in, in, in France, <clears throat> which is not respectful of any religion. Uh, <clears throat> once again, the, the French Revolution was essentially an anti-religious revolution that kicked out the Catholic Church. And that's, again, you know, if you look at the United States, the history of the United States is actually, um, you know, one where, you know, the English were fighting the Spanish, and then the Spanish then kind of handed off its empire <clears throat> to the French, who then had handed it back to the English, and wanted to focus on Mexico. And so you have this, <coughs> all these factors coming together that don't bode well for the United States, but that do bode well for the EU. <coughs> the question is, within this stratified, gerrymandered political system, is the United States going to be able to mount a challenge to the EU, given that the economic supply chains are shifting from sea-based to land-based, which favors Asia as well as Africa, without question, not just on, in terms of energy, but everything else, security and so on and so forth. And the answer to that, quite frankly, might be banking. The United States not only has one of the most powerful militaries in the whole world, it's got perhaps the best banking system in the whole world in part because it's such an expensive exercise to maintain its security, which requires insurance, right? The banking system cannot be seen, a successful banking system is inherently tied to an insurance-based system, one that essentially makes mistakes uh, non-fatal. So that is the result, my take on the election. That is my take on the near future. And I am ashamed that growing up, I used to mock the, the European, the Europe, we just mock them. They didn't have that much diversity. They weren't doing a good job in terms of, you know, defending, creating a balance between the defense of free speech and my, the defense of minority viewpoints. And quite frankly, they are still in a position where they've, they're sort of over-legalized. In other words, they've created a, a legal-based system that is onerous. But because the regulators, at the same time, are actually looking out for consumer interests, if you're in the EU today, it's an acceptable trade-off. You know, you've got this legalistic system that is expensive, that is onerous, but you realize that there's more protection in terms of privacy and so on and so forth. Uh, part of which came, came about because the American security agency, uh, the NSA has had hacked into the German chancellor's phone and was spying on essentially an ally's communications, which then led to probably put a fire under, under the EU's, under, under the EU to create a response against technological intrusion and, and those kinds of private, you know, those kinds of invasions of privacy. So here we are. It looks very much like the EU 
is going to advance. At the same time, the United States is in decline. It, part of the reason that's the case is because you know, a lot of the ideas that are being propagated by the democratic establishment are literally copies of the EU system. Uh, which again, once you start copying other people because your own systems are either not sufficient or not worthy of emulation, we don't need to know that much more to figure out where the story ends. And so we're here on a sunny day discussing the end of the American empire. But it looks like all roads now lead back to the, back to the EU and the decisions of the EU. And whether or not the United States can figure out its own path forward in a way that reclaims the story of its rise against chattel slavery, of its rise against anti-immigrant sentiments, its rise against the military industrial complex. All these things have to happen for the American empire to maintain its legitimacy in an era where it's asking its allies and everyone else to create an economic system that's based on trillions of dollars of debt.